Good. Then I will welcome the audience to the keynote, first keynote for today. And today, um, our keynote speaker is this lovely young lady that you see here. Her name is Brenda Akinajore, and she is a filmmaker and a lot of other things, which I'm gonna tell you about in a second when I pull it up. Um, and she's a circus pedagogue, which I find yeah. really fascinating. Um, she did undergraduate studies at uh, media studies at the University of Potsdam. And that's where she got interested in doing documentary film. Um, her final project included the short documentary film portrait, Va Bene, which was screened at festivals around the world and which encouraged her to pursue a career as a documentary filmmaker. And between 2018 and 2022, she studied documentary film directing at the Film University Babelsberg, uh, Konrad Wolf, and shot the short films A Way of Breathing in 2020 uh, with a young Iranian artist in Iran, Stick of Joy, also in 2020. A film about different ways of exploring sensuality in Berlin, as well as her first feature length documentary film, The Homes We Carry 2022, which is available for our participants to see when you have the link. Um, it's available until, I believe, until Sunday, but if I'm wrong, the correction will be put in the chat. And she's going to talk about this film today. Uh, her films deal so far with self-empowerment through art, queerness, or effects of migration for the individual. Brenda also works on film festivals in Berlin and as a circus pedagogue in social institutions. So without further ado, I just want to say good morning and hello and turn it over to you, Brenda. Thank you very much. Thank you for this introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Um, very happy to be, yeah, to have this opportunity and that this conference is taking place. It really steps into this gap also for me to learn more about Afro German history, to connect and yeah, to share our passion for art. Um, as you said before, the medium I choose is um, documentary film. Um, today I want to talk shortly about how I became a documentary filmmaker and yeah, about my film that deals with this Afro-German um, story. Um, yeah, so um, why I became a documentary filmmaker is actually not um, because of my big passion for cinema. When I was 25, I didn't even know so much about cinema. Uh, I, have, I was not even yeah, so much into this. But um, I was kind of frustrated about um, videos and footage that I found about Ghana. So my dad is Ghanaian and I traveled there as a kid several times. Um, so these travels for me were quite exciting, but also just normal because we used to go. And then there was this big gap between 13 and 25. I didn't go to Ghana for a long time and um, I wanted to reconnect. And I started, I was doing media studies, so I started, okay, what's the media I can find? And it was quite frustrating. I couldn't find anything authentic, anything that, um, yeah, that there was not about Germans in Ghana or about some old rituals that uh, few people practice today. So, um, yeah, I just decided as a final project of my media science studies, let's do it yourself. And I took a camera and a sound recorder and I did this, um, yeah, very nice project with six different women from different uh, parts of society. Um, and it really opened a, a complete new word, a new look on Ghana for myself. And when I came back home and I shared this with my friends and family, I really got encouraged to keep on doing documentary film. And um, 
yeah, I was encouraged to apply in film school. So yeah, this is how I got uh, to documentary film, more out of this curiosity of doing <laughs> and, and sharing different stories, let's say. So um, yeah, let me share my screen um, so you can see my presentation. Yes, can you see this? Perfect. Yeah. Um, so. so yeah, what you see right now is the, um, the poster of my film, the film The Homes We Carry um, is my final project in film school is a 90 minute um, documentary film. And yeah, as a Afro-German person, of course, I'm interested in other Afro-German family stories and the history. And when I came across this specific German Mozambican um, story, uh, I really wanted to to share it because I think it's important. Um, yeah, that these Afro-German stories are visible. A lot of them are unknown in Germany, and it's important that we are seen and we feel part of society by more knowledge. So um, yeah, I wanted to go to the next slide. Oops. How's this working? Yes. Um, so I did this film to remind of the transnational treaty between the GDR and Mozambique, so East Germany and Mozambique, that influenced thousands of lives and that has its effects still today. I did this film to make Afro-German history visible and Afro-German identity emotionally tangible and understood. I also did this film to normalize and uh, make people understand one of the many like German stories. So for those who haven't watched the film, uh, I give a little bit of background. Um, all, the film, um, all the pictures you will see in my presentation are from the film. Uh, this is some archive footage. And um, yeah, the background is that in 1979, East Germany, the GDR, and the People's Republic of Mozambique conducted a state treaty. Both countries were socialist at the time, and it was supposed to be a mutual support, um, but it turned out to be a bit different. Um, more than 20,000 Mozambican men and women came to work in East Germany between 1979 and 1989. So it's quite a big number of people. Um, and until today, this group of contract workers is really forgotten. In Germany, the Vietnamese, stayed. So th there was another group of contract workers. They really stayed and they are, these stories are known, but from the Mozambicans, it's really, yeah, unknown kind of. So um, yeah, these contract workers, so-called contract workers, were promised a better life and an education that would help them to build a future in Mozambique. But what happened is that they were mostly used to fill the gaps of labor shortage in East Germany. These workers were spread in the whole country, uh, lived in dormitories, sometimes even on the property of the of their company. They were kind of isolated um, from society and did jobs like on this picture in a coal mine um, or yeah, agriculture, some jobs that they couldn't choose themselves. So like their autonomy was taken from them. They were put into work that yeah was probably not the work that they would have liked to do. Um, and surely it was a better life for many of the young men and women because in Mozambique at the time there was a civil war raging uh, when the Portuguese had left after um, colonial time, which was very late. Um, yeah, the country was a big mess. So um, being able to buy clothes, to have a job, it was already, um, yeah, a kind of progress for many people. But um, yeah, the promised reasonable education, a job that would help them later on, was not uh, given. Integration was not wanted. Um, my protagonist, Olidio, um, who lived in near Berlin, he, for example, worked in a power plant, in a nuclear power plant. And until today, Mozambique doesn't have a nuclear power plant, so a lot of skills he learned were just not um, useful. Um, 
yeah, even though um, relationships were not really wanted by the government, uh, of course, love is everywhere and a lot of relationships formed and Elidio's girlfriend Ingrid was actually pregnant when the Berlin, when the Berlin, when the Berlin Wall fell um, and when the contract workers were forced to go back home from one day to another, the country didn't exist anymore. The contracts didn't exist anymore and they didn't have a permit to stay. So, yeah, a lot of families have been separated uh, very brutally um, in that in that moment. Um, most of the, or a lot of contract workers thought that they would be able to come back to Germany uh, once the chaos with the wall uh, is over. And there was also a lot of racism at the time. And one of the biggest reasons um, or, or let's say um, something they were expecting to get in Mozambique was also part of their salary because when they worked in Germany, a part of the salary was deducted and sent to Mozambique. So they were forced to go back home, but they thought, okay, there's this money waiting for me. And then with this money, maybe when the times are more, when the times are easier, we can come back to the family. Um, but what happened in reality is that, um, yeah, until today, a part of the money has not been paid. For some of the workers, it has been up until 60% of their salary. Um, so, yeah, this is um, this is a, an incredible um, fact that a lot of people don't know. And until today, uh, some of these contract workers, they demonstrate and they are asking for their rights in the capital of Maputo in Mozambique. So I want to show you a little snippet of the film. Um, if the film shouldn't play properly, uh, I also put you the link in the group. Maybe also we can put it again so everybody has it, but I will just try to play it now from my laptop.
So that was some impression of the demonstration in Maputo in um, yeah, Mozambique. Um, just, um, oops. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. So it is not clear how many uh, families have been separated, but it's it's quite a lot of yeah broken relationships, families, and kids that had to grow up without their father because yeah in the 90s it was just really hard to keep the contact um like one of the former contract workers also says in the film even some of the families had racist um thoughts and didn't want the black father to even be in contact uh with the child some of the mothers were ashamed hurt uh, and didn't even reach out to the father so until today there is um this process of re reuniting families. Um, there's two NGOs who are also helping um, kids to find their fathers or fathers to find their kids. Um, yeah, so this is a still ongoing um, process. Um, Sarah, who is the main protagonist of my film, is one of those who grew up with a picture of her father on the fridge, a picture on which she is barely in his 20s, a picture that made her create her own story about her father. She told me that it was a big shock when she met him once um, she was 11 years old because he was so different than in her imagination. But after the shock, she fell in love with her family and father and hid when the mom wanted to go back home to Germany. Having faced a lot of othering and racism in Germany, the experience in Mozambique to be accepted, to be seen as a beautiful young woman and to be around other black bodies, she describes as magical. So mm -hmm. yeah, growing up without having the black parents um, makes it hard for you to identify with your blackness makes it hard for you to say, I am black, makes it hard for you to be proud. In a white society, you are constantly addressed and reminded that you are black, but probably you cannot connect anything to it. So once Sarah was 18 years old, she, become, she became a flight attendant and traveled off into Mozambique to get to know the culture and the family and um, yeah, more profoundly. And with 25, she even lived there for one and a half years. So for Sarah, as well as it was for me, um, it, it was very important to give some meaning to the Afro part in our identity. I don't say it's the only way, um, but for us, the travel were the crucial thing on a journey of self-love, acceptance, and of feeling proud and confident in your own skin. So um, I want to show one more part of the film now um, about Sarah talking about her hair and her skin. Um, another two minutes, I think.
Mm. Yeah, I love this theme so much um, because we try to edit it. Uh, yeah, very complex. I think it is really complex and it really shows um, a difficulty that we as Afro Germans all face. <laughs> In the German society, we are seen as black. Our hair is curly, African, different. But in the African community, we are seen as white. Our hair is straighter, softer, different. This feeling of not belonging can be painful if you live in space. If you try to adapt um, and if you don't understand the beauty within yourself. So... Um, yeah, you can feel torn, you can feel very in between. Even words that we sometimes use to describe ourselves um, emphasize that I am half German, half Ghanaian, half Mozambican in Sarah's uh, case. But are we not full German with this amazing extra? <laughs> so, um, yeah, in the beginning of the filming process, I focused a lot on the identity struggle of Sarah, of not being able to fully identify with one side, of being torn. But the more Sarah and I talked and reflected, and the more I watched the footage of her being in Mozambique and Germany, I realized she is part of both cultures. One of my favorite quotes of Sarah in the film is, ich kann beides und ich hab beides. I can do both and I have both. And that's the beauty, in my opinion, of any bicultural identity. It doesn't matter what other people say or don't understand. She does not have, has, oh, she does not have to be considered black in Mozambique to live, love, grow, connect, and to be a part of the family and culture. She does not have to be white to be a German. With this in mind, um, yeah, Sarah closes the film saying that for her child, Luana, whose father is a Mozambican, living in Mozambique, she wants to create a strong connection to Mozambique from young age on, so that her daughter always feels like she has two homes to feel safe. Yeah, so <laughs> that was it um, from my part. Um, if you haven't watched the film, please, um, yeah, watch it. <laughs> um, it's until Sunday, and um, yeah, open now for you, Elizabeth, or questions. Mm -hmm. um, I will open up the question section. Um, my asking you. When you were in Mozambique or when you are in Ghana, um, what is the feeling of, of belonging there as contrasted with the feeling of belonging in Germany? Mm. Yeah, so I think the experience of Sarah and me is different. Uh, I will I will get to this a bit later, but um, yeah, I would say um, if I'm in Ghana, as I as I have never been really living there, I don't feel offended that people um, don't see me as a Ghanaian and. Yeah, I get I get this mirrored, you know, like the way people approach to me if I would go or when I was going, I don't know, to a village or not such a touristic place. I am the white person. And in a way it's true because I am a German and I grew up in Germany. So I am actually not offended by this. Um of course it's so different and it was so beautiful when I would walk with my father. Uh, if I would walk with my father somewhere, uh people immediately get it and um, he's the one who can also talk the local language I can't so um, I am not expecting the Ghanaians um, to yeah to completely um, see me as a Ghanaian because I'm not me myself I identify as a German and I have this um, 
yeah, this this extra, you know, I'm I'm also Ghanaian, but in first place for me, I am German. I lived in Germany for um yeah, ninety eight percent of my life. So um yeah, and that's also a feeling that I get when I'm there, but I'm fine with this. Um so I think where this um where Sarah and I have different experiences is on how much racism we felt as a kid or as a teenager. So I grew up in Western um, Germany, where she grew up in Eastern part, and a lot of stories uh, from black people in that part of Germany are like really brutal and terrible and traumatizing. So her feeling of not being part of German society was way bigger Hence, the need to feel more accepted in Mozambique for her was also bigger. Yeah. So, Excuse me, Linda, I have to interrupt you for a second. Could you close your screen, Sharon, because no one can see you? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you go. <laughs> okay, so yeah, for Sarah, yeah, so, yeah. bigger. You were saying, yeah, that was, yeah, that was just my point that, um, that. For her, like also this need of being accepted in Mozambique um, and the search for her was a, was a different one because she had such a strong feeling of uh, yeah being othered as a kid, as a teenager, uh, being bullied for her skin, for her hair. Um, so in Germany, I'm, I, don't, I didn't make so many bad experiences. So it's also easier for me to feel connected and feel a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel like you were contributing by making this film, contributing to the, the resistance against this injustice of holding back the, the salaries of the, these workers, that you were also making a contribution just by the fact that you made this film? Um, I think uh, now would be too much to say that politic politicians watched the film and now are finally acting. I mean, this is ongoing for, um, yeah, for more than 30 years. And there's NGOs and a lot of people talking to politicians and it's still discussions in Germany because Germany has like this mid choice, like it's also kind of responsible. But um, yeah, the Mozambican government is really just closing their ears and eyes. This demonstration is going in front of the government every Wednesday and they are just not responding. So um, yeah, also, unfortunately, um, the film was until now more used uh, or can be more used for now in Germany to raise awareness. And there's this NGO who also is really happy about it, that there's um, more communication, like newspapers are talking about it, but it's still ongoing. It's still not solved. And yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. I think possibly many, many people in Germany are simply not aware of this situation so um, like you are helping to just create an awareness for this not necessarily among the politicians but just among the people in Germany mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure not everybody would be okay with that um, mm -hmm. with that situation so we do have a question and someone writes, and I say someone because the name is Anonyme Zuschauer. <laughs> Hi, did her mother not want to be interviewed or was that not needed? Hmm. Yeah. So um, when I started um, to write the film, the mother was included, uh, it was a family story. And I also really wanted to yeah, have the perspective of the mom. Um, but as I mentioned in my presentation, for a lot of mothers, it was really hard and painful and also shameful because the society didn't like this kind of relationship. 
and I feel um, even for Sarah's mom, this is still somewhere that she's not so confident of like bringing her story out into the screen. You know, you have to imagine it was society, the own family who didn't like this. And um, yeah, it's still a lot of uh, very painful. And um, then at one point she said, okay, yeah, maybe I will join the film. And then she was going back again. And uh, at one point I had to accept that she, that she just doesn't want to be on screen. Um, once the film was done, she was really happy with it. And now she also thinks that her perspective is kind of missing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but we closed the film and I couldn't do anything about it. Um, but yeah, the story of um, of the mothers is also, yeah, it's like these strong women who, who grew up, uh, who raised all the kids um, by themselves in a super racist society. Um, Sarah's mom was amazing because uh, she made it possible that Sarah could uh, reach out to her father. They had contact uh, writing. Uh, she made it possible to see the father. Other mothers were not even trying to reach out. So she's a very strong woman. Um, she didn't want Sarah to um, grow up being the only black child all the time. So she was actually putting a an answer in the journal like she was looking for other black kids to play with her kid so she has other peers to um to connect um and yeah one of these girls is in the film and is still her best friend today so um yeah just to share a bit about the mother <laughs> yeah that's very nice <laughs> um the next question comes from Steffi. And she says, I'm curious to learn about the legal grounds. On what legal grounds did these deportations take place after the vendor? Um, mm. Was the law preventing the workers from marrying their German girlfriends? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the deportation is, mm, is, is more complex. Like so, like it's, it's a very complex topic. I often say they were kind of forced. They were not deportated, like like put in in the airplane. But you have to understand the whole background. So, um, um, a lot of the contract workers just got their flight ticket back home, and as they were really isolated, they didn't get the information. Um, it was super chaotic. Um, after the war, it was really racist. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of reasons why they felt like they don't have another choice. Um, yeah, as they were so isolated, they, they didn't even know, okay, if I don't live in my dormitory anymore, where do I go? Um, and as I said before, a lot of them thought they would be able to come back. Um, so it was actually not impossible to get married. Um, but there was a big lack of information, um, and it was just made really hard. And what my protagonist also said is it was from one day to another. There was their bosses giving them a flight ticket next week, you're going, and then you will get your money. And then we take it from there. And it was also really young men. They were like 19, 20 years old. My protagonist was also homesick and he was like, oh, I was so happy to also go see my family and, and then come back. So deportation is maybe not the right term. It's a really, um, yeah, kind of uh, complex situation that they were in. Mm -hmm. But they, they didn't have work permits anymore. So their contract kind of stopped from one day to another. Mm. Yeah, I mean, many things were confusing right after the wall came down. Um, not only for contract workers, but for German citizens, also citizens of the GDR, which also at a certain point, just there was no more country. So yeah, exactly. It, it was... Uh, I think it's like hard to imagine how chaotic and how difficult that time was. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, that's also why um, to get this money for the contract workers is so so complex. You know, you're talking about the GDR, which doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Can you imagine living in Ghana for a time? Mm. So when I was there with 25, um, I was tempted <laughs> to try it for some time. Um, but at the same time, yeah, my connection is not strong enough. Like I don't have my network there. Um, I can imagine doing another project there. Or I mean, right now I'm also living in Portugal. I can imagine living there. Like I can also imagine right now living in Portugal. It's but it's not um, right now. It's not really something I'm I'm planning. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, as I said before, I also feel foreign there uh, in a way. Maybe more than Sara, she lived there for one and a half years. It's really different. I was always there for a couple of weeks, a couple like two months was the maximum I was staying uh, for my first film project. So. Um, now, for me, it's not really an option being a filmmaker and sacred pedagogue and really wanting to pursue this. I have my networks right now um, here. So, yeah. Okay, we have another question here from Barton. Could you talk about how the film was produced and is being distributed? Who were the local collaborators <clears throat> in Mozambique or South Africa? And where is the film's cultural and institutional home in international documentary and yeah. yours as a filmmaker? <laughs> um, so the film was my final project from university. Um, so my German university. And we are a co-production with a company called Film5 and the RBB, which is, um, yeah, like, um, Broadcasting uh, institution. Um, so local collaborators in Maputo were the Goethe Institute, um, and yeah, friends and filmmakers we met along the way. Um, in South Africa, we also had um, we reached out to university to also have some like a diverse team of people, but we didn't have extra uh, production companies. Um, it was really the first time I went, I went twice for the film and the first time we went to Mozambique, we went with almost no money because Sarah wanted to travel and we wanted to go with her and we didn't have the money yet. And we, um, yeah, got, got some money from university, just went with her and really did like a super low budget, um, version, um, of, yeah, bringing our expensive camera from university to the small, uh, to the small buses and um, I did the sound and the cinematographer was on my side so we were really just two people the first time um, in Mozambique and South Africa and then yeah the second time we had a bit of a bigger setup because we got some money with the first uh, footage so yeah local home of the film is um, Germany Berlin also my space mm -hmm. And distribution, uh, we had our premiere in Doc Leipzig as a, um, one of the biggest German documentary film festivals. And we will have our Berlin premiere soon. Uh, international premiere is at Film de Femme in France. And uh, American premiere, I cannot say, but it's ah, Canadian, Canadian uh, premiere. I cannot say yet, but um, yeah, <laughs> we have it. <laughs> So it's still touring this year. Mm. Okay, a question from Jason is, we hear of many challenges to film distribution in several parts of Africa, and it seems too politically sensitive for broadcast in Mozambique. So how do you hope more Mozambicans will see it? Mm -hmm. Are broadcast in South Africa and getting funding for it to be shown online without a paywall possibilities? Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good point. 
uh, for now we are just planning screenings in um, in Mozambique. Uh, it's also one film festival that we're applying. Um, we're still looking for another distribution company, which could probably also help us with this. But um, yeah, we're also aware of the of the cha challenges and also the style of the film. Uh, I don't see in in TV in uh, Mozambican TV, even if yeah, also it's too sensitive, like the the person has mentioned. And what was it? If 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 what was possible? Uh, what was the last if, part of if it's like broadcast in South Africa and you get funding for it to be shown online without a paywall, if that's maybe a possibility. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, we're still working on that uh, on that strategy, and we uh, help is <laughs> very welcome. Um, yeah, I think for now we're we were looking more for Mozambique and yeah, and and the German uh, distribution because South Africa is more like a small part of the of the story and the film. Yeah, but thanks for the question. Yeah. So oh. there are like no more questions in the question and answer section. I think. Wait a minute, I'll take a look. No, those there are no more questions there for the moment. Um, is there anything that you would particularly like to mention or like to talk about? Maybe even beyond this film, I know that in the information you sent me that um, you spoke about one of your subjects being the intersectionality of queerness and migration in the background. Um, can you talk about that? Have you done like any specific work on that? Yeah, so um, yeah, the the same production company that I produced uh, this film with um, invited me for another project, which was about um, yeah the ballroom culture in Berlin, and so yeah, it's about this um, black queer um, performance performative culture, and it's a series I produced uh, last year which will be coming out in uh, in a couple of months. It's not, it's not completely clear. So yeah, I think for me, um, this intersection is, is really interesting as well as, um, yeah, to say, um, yeah, I mean, every, every subculture, every group opens such a big horizon and, um, yeah, this is just what I love about documentary film. I can always dive into something else, learn from it, and um, yeah, and share it. Open, open eyes, make people connect to something um, that they thought, oh, I have no, no touching. Um, I'm not touching the subject at all. So also, I think this is something that with this film was so amazing on the film festivals having. Um, yeah, people that have not a uh, African parent or anything to do with the story felt really touched. So this is really amazing and shows me that the power of film, let's say. Yeah. And um, no, I, I don't think I have um, something something else right now. Oh, there's another question. Mm. Can you talk about how you do that? How do you help people connect to these topics with which they may not be familiar? Yeah, it's, I think it's the finding the emotional part um, that that is always touching. So for example, with this film, it's really easy because the subject of family, everybody can somehow um, relate. Um, finding the, the emotional story and um, yeah, really taking the time to work um, 
to work with the people, to listen, to listen. And then the editing process is always a big process where you really try to, to bring the sentences, the images, so um, to shape it so much that, um, yeah, the essence is something that people can connect to. Um, yeah, I think there's some universal, uh, universal things, you know, of, of belonging that everybody had to face. So if I'm talking about belonging to uh, to like black or white culture, maybe somebody else can relate this to belonging to, you know, the parents are probably not from different countries, but have different uh, values and yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your current or your future projects? Um, yeah, I'm having a little, <laughs> A little creative, um, not break, but like recovery <laughs> from uh, from the last project, and I'm right now working, let's say, on something about transformation and community. I think community is always something I find very, very interesting. And um, yeah, I'm right now living in Portugal in a alternative community. Um, and researching and living the research and um, yeah, I'm just really interested in in different ways of relating and living also then, yeah. <laughs> so it's nothing concrete, but um, I'm in the research phase right now. Mm -hmm. mm. um, there is another question from Robin. She says, thank you for sharing this beautiful film. I learned so much. Could you share some thoughts on gender roles in these intercultural transnational families in the film? Thinking, for example, of the idea that a male really becomes a man when he becomes a father. What does it mean when this happens via WhatsApp, for example? Ah, yeah, it's, it's a big topic. I, I talked a lot with my um with my editor about this because I mean this only makes sense for the people who have watched the film, but um the young father, the father of um Luana, of Sarah's um ex partner, um is this very kind of stereotypical man that thinks you can only be a man once you are a father and um with this kind of yeah, traditional thoughts and in the beginning I, I I felt really I felt a bit weird about this because I met in Mozambique and Maputo so many men with different uh, ideas that I thought okay if now in my film the Mozambican man that I show is like with this traditional thinking what what image will this will this bring out um but I also I can't change my protagonist and the reality. And um, what I hope, what we have with Olidio, with Sara's father, is um, understanding also a bit more um, his side. So he could also be seen as, or just, no, how to say, with Olidio, we are trying to, um, to broaden this image, you know? Like, I think with the two men, we have, still quite some some different um yeah different things um that we can see and that we can learn um yeah but um <laughs> yeah with, with my protagonist yeah I, I i had this i had this thought okay what what is the gender stereotype that we are reproducing now um Mm, yeah, we we thought about this quite a lot. <laughs> um, can what is the other part of the question? I think I got a bit. Um, yeah, what does it mean when mm. this happens? I mean, this being mm. father happens via WhatsApp, you know, mm. not not directly and not personally. Mm. I mean, to be honest, I feel like for 
Eduardo, it was um, almost as much as a celebration as if it had happened, um, <laughs> as if it had happened. I, I'm quite sure he was doing exactly the same that uh, <laughs> he, he would have done uh, if it was in the place, going out, being happy. Um, yeah, but um, it's especially after Luana left, I think, that um, that he really realized this um, this situation and this um, this distance because he didn't really become a father when she was born. Also, Sarah always said this. He became a father once Luana was there. You know, um, he suddenly had to grow up and and be a father, and that's also the struggle that we see. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you still have contact with your protagonist? Yes, we, we were, um, I mean, with Sarah, she was in our German premiere and she will be in the Berlin premiere and she is now so happy about the film. We were having this crazy roller coaster. There were times where she didn't uh, want her story anymore on a on a big screen or where she was unsure because she she didn't see the footage for so long. We were working on it for quite some time before we felt confident of showing her. And I think that really made her unsure. And now she's just so happy that this story that also, you know, she she was not proud as a teenager and now she can be proudly tell her story. So yeah, our contact is really good. Um, with Olivia, we were trying to get him even maybe to one of the screenings. It would be so amazing if we could get him back to Germany, but his uh, health is not really good. And um, yeah, it's, for now we didn't we didn't manage, but that's something. Yeah, we're we're still trying to have him probably for the Berlin um, premiere. And Eduardo and Sara are not so much in contact anymore. And also me and Eduardo are not so much in contact anymore. Um, but he has seen the film and he's also happy about it, about having this piece of memory. Um, and yeah. Yeah, that would be that would be so wonderful if you could get a video tool. Yeah. To come to Germany. Mm. Um, we're almost out of time. We have like time for one more question. Mm. Has anybody got one more question? Look over here. Mm -hmm. I'll just post the uh, link of the website of the film also here in the chat. Yeah. So that they can follow your work and uh, see what um, what you're doing in the in the future. I'm looking forward very much to seeing your film about the ballroom community. I suppose you can imagine <laughs> why. Um, I can. Yes. It's very different. <laughs> Well, this is this is complete different style, um, but yeah, it, it, would be, <laughs> it would be completely different. I think. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so the last thing that pops up in the question and answer is neither is not a question. It's from Love Anufuro. Just want to say. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for listening, for inviting. Um, yeah, for being open for this opportunity. It's really nice. Mm. Yeah, it's been really lovely listening to you. And I can really recommend for all the people who have not yet watched the film, please, please do so. It's it's an experience that you shouldn't miss. Um, so thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. And I'm really looking forward to seeing more of your work and knowing more about you. 
And the next time we meet, I guess I, I want to talk about being a circus pedagogue. <laughs> <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Um, the link is once again in the chat. So maybe um, you can, um, for people who have not yet seen it, maybe you can uh, pick up the link from the chat. And otherwise, I guess I will just say a personal thank you very much for being here and sharing with us and i wish you all the best lots of new and great ideas to make documentaries about forgotten parts of our society mm -hmm. thank you so much thank you also for the questions and the love in the chat mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's always> amazing <laughs> okay